Hey, everybody. Are you with me when I say life can be amazing at times, but it can also be extremely challenging? I know. I've been there myself. Learned some valuable life lessons along the way, and now I'm here to help you. It's no coincidence you've found your way to the Relevate podcast. I'm your host, Rena Olson, a self-proclaimed inspirer of others. Together, we're going to dive deep into raw and honest conversations with real people. My hope is that through these stories, you too will be inspired and ready to tackle whatever's holding you back or breaking your heart. Then you'll be free to live a life of purpose and true fulfillment. I promise it's possible. Let's Relevate. Hey, friends. It's people like Jen Heidinger Kendrick, my guest on this episode, who are true embodiments of the Relevate podcast. See, Jen's story is both inspirational and heartbreaking. Somehow, she found the courage, strength, and grit to move her pain into action with the help and support of many leaders from the Atlanta restaurant community. She is having a chance to pay it back through the nonprofit organization that would ultimately become The Giving Kitchen, a social support agency and safety net for Georgia's food service workers. Jen's story is also about the power of community, the Atlanta food service community to be exact, and what is possible when we all come together in love and support of one another. I know you'll enjoy this hope-filled episode as much as I did. Jen Heidinger Kendrick, welcome to the Relevate Podcast. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Well, it is so great to finally meet you. I have heard just amazing things about what you're doing and um, really, really appreciate you taking the time to have a chat with me and to to share your story. Oh, it is my pleasure. And I will say it definitely takes a a team and community effort. So I'm I'm happy to talk about it. So how do you describe yourself? Myself personally? Yeah. Oh, full of energy. I am one of those people that doesn't require a ton of sleep. Mm. Um, My husband says I'm like the energizer bunny when I roll out of bed. Uh, So really energetic. Um, I'm really positive, Mm -hmm. pretty introspective. And I would say I really appreciate when people think I'm kind. That's such, yeah, that's a great compliment. And did I read that you worked for an ad agency for a little bit? Yeah, I did. My So my late husband and I um, actually are both from Indianapolis, Indiana. Uh, and when we moved to Atlanta in late t- um, 2004, I ended up getting a job with my uh, brother-in-law at the time. He worked at an ad agency and helped me get my foot in the door because it was right after college. I had just graduated from college. Um, but yeah, that was my first kind of step in my professional career. Um, the the original uh, career, if you will, was at an ad agency here in Atlanta. Yeah, same here. I learned a lot. Yeah, exactly. I learned a lot. Yeah, so much. Okay, so let's talk about Ryan, your first love. Just Uh if you can just share more about him. Yeah, so we met uh, back home in Indianapolis, Indiana. I was actually a senior in high school. Uh, He was a 22-year-old chef working Mm. nearby at a catering company. And I was actually, I was working at a grocery store, a local community grocery store as a cashier and an office manager at the time. Um, And he lived across the street and he came in and we met. He would buy packs of bubble gum just to walk through the cashier line just to Uh. say hi and, uh, and have a few, you know, exchange a few words. The sweetness of the year 2000, 20 years ago. That's crazy. Uh, And so we, it was just kind of love at first sight for me is actually the way I always tell that story. He always would say it took him a little bit longer, Uh, (laughs) but it was for me, it was, it was a pretty immediate connection. I remember, you know, we exchanged pleasantries and then just got to to learn about each other at a young age and just really developed a really beautiful and strong foundation early on and dated all through college. And um, right after I graduated from college is when he proposed. And then we moved to Atlanta and got married a year later. Mm. Nice. His heart was always in the food industry. It was, yes. Yeah. So he, he um, being from Indianapolis, a small kind of town, um, he decided instead of a four-year college degree that he wanted to do something tactile and work with his hands and do something in the trade. And so he ended up going to culinary school and came here into Atlanta, mm-hmm. actually, for culinary school back in 97, 98, and was here for a couple of years. And it's so interesting because back then, he had always said, you know, for years later that he felt like Atlanta defeated him, sp- oh. like quote unquote. Mm-hmm. 
And I always found that so fascinating when you get, you know, Atlanta then from it being this, not necessarily this like, you know, big cultural hub for food and beverage, uh, where it is, you know, today in like the last maybe eight to 10 years. But he really felt back then that Atlanta was just too big, you know, and he had he wanted to go back home and kind of repurpose home at that point. So he did. And then we met and we ended up moving back to Atlanta in 2004 after a long uh, cross country road trip around the United States and had no idea where we wanted to live, but decided that, you know, along that journey that we would just find our place. And it ended up being that we were in Corpus Christi, Texas, when um, a hurricane hit where his dad and stepmom lived in Florida. So it kind of stopped our road trip a little bit early. I ended up flying to Atlanta because it was one of the closest cities nearby. We had planned to stop through there anyway, and we had some family living there at the time. And then he, after he helped his his dad and stepmom out of kind of that wreckage, he drove to Atlanta and we were like, okay, we'll stay here maybe six months, a year. We'll just figure it out. And have never left. So the I love how the whole supper house idea started at your house. Share more about that because that is so oh, yeah, so cool. the beautiful fond memories. I, I really I love it so much. So um, Ryan had been working in the in the culinary community here in Atlanta for some time. Um, again, we starting in about two thousand four, late two thousand four, and he actually uh, started working on the line at Bacchanalia, mm-hmm. which is one of um, oh, yeah. uh, kind of Atlanta's premier you know totally. tasting menu uh, chef and uh, just a, a beautiful beautiful, wonderful mentor, businesswoman, um, has been here for a very long time. She's a staple in our town, if not in, and absolutely in our, in the Southeast region. And he knew that if we were going to stay in Atlanta, he had to work for the best chef here. And so that's, that's when he had the opportunity to work at Bacchanalia. He, about a year and a half or so later, she promoted him to sous chef at a sister restaurant. And so we moved over there. And a little bit after that, he decided to kind of, um, just try a, a new path uh, here in Atlanta and ended up moving to what was then a sandwich shop in Smyrna, Georgia called Muslim Turners, where we ended up meeting extremely close friends, uh, like brothers and some business mentors, uh, his bosses at the time, where he ended up staying for about eight years. Um, and it was it was during the so Muslim familiar. Turners time uh, I I that we decided, you know, along that journey that there was there was Atlanta obviously had some really great opportunity that was kind of untapped, we thought. And we knew that if we were going to really settle in and build our roots here, that we really needed to engage with the community. And that was that was really our, our deciding factor for wanting to create mm-hmm. Prelude to Staple House, which ended up being a supper club that we hosted out of our home. Uh, we knew for us, it was really a beautiful grassroots style kind of effort to get to learn the people within our city and our community mm-hmm. and offer them our type of hospitality, uh, which was a very Midwestern style, but now, you know, with kind of a Southern, you know, flair and, and to be able to showcase Ryan's talent and, and, you know, passion with food, his style of finesse, uh, his approach to, you know, textures and flavors. And with me, it was really just more of, I was an incredible, incredibly supportive wife. I loved watching him create and be in the kitchen. And um, so for me at the beginning, it was more of just being the supportive wife and host, always the entertainer. I always, you know, again, going back to the energy roots, uh, loved a party. Uh, So that's kind of the impetus for starting Prelude to Staple House. And it was about a year in that we realized we could do this and we wanted to do this as a of like a business and we wanted to go into it and partner together um, and create what was hopefully going to be one day um, a restaurant called Staple House. So how many people would you have in your house at any given time for um, these parties? We, I actually still have the original dining room table that we set everybody around, but we have kind of an open, oh, it's a small house, a small home, but um, it's all open. Um, six at the dining room table and four at our little breakfast bar that was open to the kitchen. So we could have 10 that and, and Ryan would be in inside the kitchen and facing everybody. So it was a really kind of open style format. I just love that. So from there, the idea of Staple House came about. And then y'all started percolating that idea. And um, tell me what happened, Jen. We did. So in 2010 is when we decided that we could um, really kind of do this for ourselves and we could start that traction and and that momentum of putting together a business plan. We ended up hiring a business consultant. We ended up hiring, you know, a real estate agent. And we really just kind of hit the ground running and started to put together those resources to go to banks and go to investors and guarantors, et cetera. And it, um, 
it was, you know, right after the recession hit. So we were, you know, trying to build a business at the time where the economy was, you know, very poor, but we never lost sight of, of that dream, if you will. And so we continued with Prelude to Staple House uh, it, almost every weekend. It was pretty much any any free time we had. He had a full time job mm-hmm. at the restaurant. I was in advertising and had working at some retail. Um, so both had full time jobs. And um, we would send out, I remember we would send out a, a menu via email to like less than 200 people. And we would say, hey, you know, who wants to come? You have to eat with strangers, but here's the menu. If you're interested, email back. Uh, we'll save you a spot. There's only 10. You know, we're asking for a donation. It's a five course meal. We'll pair wines. It was a really kind of novel concept for Atlanta. Yeah. It was not a novel concept for places like Seattle or LA or New York, um, who had been doing kind of these underground style format dinners for some time. But for Atlanta, no one was doing it. And so that's really, we just, we, we led with that. We led with that type of community and, and, you know, hospitality. And we did that for quite a long time. We, we, it was uh, up until uh, December of 2012, but we would host dinners and a couple of large parties and, and just knew that at one point this idea for a restaurant could come to fruition. It just took a really, really long time. It was a few years before he was diagnosed. And his health was good up until that point. Perfect. Yeah. I mean, never, literally never missed a day of work in his life for a cold, like just perfect health. I mean, just never sick. Um, and it was, so it was, you know, for, for most blue. people, we talk about that a lot, you know, what crisis is like. And um, it was, it was 100% crisis um, in a very unexpected time. He, you know, he, we had, I had given him a ticket to New York. He had never been as a chef kind of sacrilegious to have never been to New York. And at that point I had given him a ticket to New York to be there for 12 hours, just to go to like a few places and eat. And he ended up going with uh, my now brother-in-law um, and they ended up going 12 hours, really enjoyed themselves. And he came back and the very next morning, it ended up having some flu-like symptoms, mm-hmm. which persisted for some days. And it got to the point where he missed several days of work, which was incredibly abnormal. Uh, so we sent him in to get an ultrasound, which led to an MRI. And later that afternoon on December 12th of 2012 was when we realized he had a, a terminal cancer diagnosis of six months with stage four gallbladder cancer. Cannot imagine getting that news because how old were you at that time? Like 29? Um, my God, how old was I? Uh, thir- not t- 30, not even 29. Mm. Yeah, 29, almost 30. I think he died. He died when I was 30. Yeah. And he was 35. Wow. So did you, when did you start to discover your strength in all of this? You know, I, I love that question because that's actually a question I kind of, in a roundabout way, tend to ask people when I am kind of in a similar situation. I always ask about their kind of life defining moment, you know, what, what happened in their lives to change the trajectory. And for me, there, there's a couple moments, something happened kind of a first life lef- lesson for me when I was young, a toddler, but even again, kind of another kind of a repurpose, a redefining moment was after he passed. And I had the ability, you know, he was given a six month terminal cancer diagnosis. And I remember my mom asking in those first few days, like, well, what is the doctor saying? And his family asking, well, what are the doctors saying? And me having to kind of say, I wanted to protect everybody, sure. including myself, but having to say, these are the words that, you know, a doctor is saying to us is that he has six months and to try to comprehend that is unfathomable. Um, and, but Ryan had a really beautiful perspective on life. He, um, he really approached it with, um, awe and honesty. Um, and he, he even had said, you know, at this, at the, at the fundraiser that ended up being put on for us to aid in our benefit, he stood up on stage in front of a thousand people and said, this is just a part of my journey. And so we led with that last year, that, um, you know, his purpose was meant to just kind of be a beacon of hope for other people. And he really led that way. He was, um, a, a, you know, a spiritual person, not, not super religious, but just really allowed, um, that type of selflessness, you know, to, to prevail for others. So we, the others, including myself, you know, his best friends and family weren't afraid. My gosh cannot imagine. And what a leader. I mean, I keep reading about the quotes and the leadership and he was just such a natural born leader too. He really was. He was a really beautiful leader. Really. um, I always say, you know, he was a good old Indiana boy at his roots, just a really modest and humble individual, really funny, um, but a really good leader. 
Yeah. So let's talk about the Atlanta restaurant community coming together to support you and what that looked like. Because, I mean, yeah. I just, uh, it really makes me proud of, of my town and, and the food service community. So t- talk a little bit about what that looked like. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I love having kind of that sense of pride for our, our community and, you know, community, especially right now with what we're facing in the world is, you know, can be a small community, can be your your neighbors, or it can be, you know, a larger community like your city or, you know, your town or, or extended and it's pretty awesome. And for us, that's that's really what happened is that, you know, he was diagnosed and we gave this information to his bosses and obviously our all of our friends and family. And it was three specific individual who ended up coming to us. Um, it was his bosses at the time and who are dear friends and like brothers to me today, Chris Hall, Todd Musman and Ryan Turner of Muss and Turner's and multiple restaurants now. Uh, and they they called us up and came over to the house one day and said, we want to help you. And it was at that moment, you know, we, as a young couple, never wanting help, never seeking help, um, something I talk about a lot. And we, at that moment, we really had no other choice. Um, We really had to kind of just let that, you know, that armor down and and just say, yes, yes, do whatever you need to do. And for them, it was a matter of they wanted to make sure that their dear friend um, had no financial burden through, you know, his his year of cancer and whatever means possible, there would be no, you know, roadblocks to get um, anything that we needed medically. Um, Ryan was fully covered under insurance, but ultimately, you know, there's... um, an incredible amount of expense when things, you know, like that can hit you. Uh, and so that's really what happened is that they helped with a committee of people, dear friends and family put on a benefit, a fundraiser, um, that we aptly named team Heidi, Heidi being short for our last name of Heidinger. And, um, it was, it happened in three and a half weeks time. I mean, from the date of his cancer diagnosis to the time that the fundraiser was put on was less than four weeks, Mm. um, which is like unheard of because the type of gathering that happens usually takes a year to plan. Totally. Uh, so it was, it was, it was literally less, um, it was about 850 people showed up, 40 restaurants and bars. Oh um, there was a live gosh. auction of like 13 to 15 live auction lots. Amazing and, and food. Raising, sure. Yeah. Right. It, it ended up raising um, just shy of $300,000 for us. And that was really kind of what ignited the spark and idea for, for the giving kitchen. Wow. So what did that conversation look like after that event when giving kitchen was born? Yeah. It, you know, it, it's, so his, his boss, um, one of them, Ryan Turner, um, namely came over and to our house, uh, after that benefit and sat us down and just kind of had a heart to heart. Um, he had a dream that I think woke him up late at night. Um, and he had just kind of this clear vision of, you know, what does it mean to be medicine? Mm. And I remember him, he came over that afternoon that day and it was just a few days after team Heidi and had told us about this. And he said, what if Staple House could be your form of medicine, another form of medicine for this time, but also what if this restaurant that you've been wanting and working so tirelessly on for years to open, what if it became a restaurant of purpose instead of just this traditional restaurant? Um, And that was really the idea of what if we gave back to our community from a nonprofit perspective to help other food service workers um, in their time of crisis. So whether it was a medical diagnosis like Mm -hmm. cancer, which Mm -hmm. happens all the time, or if it was another, you know, illness or an injury or a housing disaster, like a flood or fire, or the death of an immediate family member, there can be an organization that's out there to help support those food service workers in their time of need in the same way that we were helped. Um, so that's really, that's really how it happened is we, we said, yes, let's, let's, we what, have to do what that. What an that, idea. What an idea. That's what we have to do. That wow. was our mission. Wow. And to have the, those three balls in the air of loving and caring for your husband with terminal cancer and then developing a restaurant and a nonprofit at the same time. It's like, wow. Yeah, there there was a lot going on, but I think, you know, for us, it was, it was, it was a true form of medicine. I ended up leaving my full-time job to be his full-time caregiver, which was necessary. And then to also act as kind of a pseudo executive director for those first 12 months, along with a, a few other founding members as well. And, um, really took that year to, you know, to realize what was important for us and our family and friends, and just to try to work on something that felt good about giving back. 
Awesome. So the the restaurant, Staple House, you had family support to get it open after Ryan's passing. Is that correct? We did. We absolutely did. So um, right after uh, he was diagnosed, actually, we ended up forming, um, we kind of opened up our business partnership beyond just him and I and ended up teaming up with Ryan's younger sister um, and her husband, Ryan Smith. So it ended up being two Ryans, a Kara and a Jen, um, mm-hmm. who formed this partnership to open up the restaurant. And then you progress. He he did pass in January of 2014. And we, as the threesome, then moved that forward and carried it forward to open up the restaurant in September of 2015, which ended up being two years after the inception and birth of Giving Kitchen, which was already at that point kind of a functioning and established nonprofit, which is pretty spectacular. That is good. So I guess it wasn't true just for you that you were using purpose to move your grief into action. You were surrounded by family members who were also working to get to make the dream happen of Staple House. Absolutely. You know, Ryan and his family are, were, you know, were really, really close. And especially he and his siblings, Kara, his younger sister and his older brother, Scott, um, and Kara and her husband, Ryan, have been in the food service industry since they were teenagers. So it was, um, yes, to, to have that family support. But it really, I mean, it really became their restaurant, too. It wasn't just ours and them fulfilling, you know, this help. It was, this became, you know, this core unit of and having, you know, a really big purpose and mission to, to not only have a restaurant and to see, you know, Ryan's legacy, part of his legacy come to fruition, but we also really had deep intentions to make it one of the best restaurants in the country. Uh, that was, I mean, it was, it was bigger than kind of all of us at that point. Um, and then, you know, for, for me, it was always carrying the, the, the passion and the, um, commitment to having a voice uh, for our nonprofit because, you know, what was born, you know, out of this tragedy was something so beautiful. So for me, it was always looking to that bigger picture of how do we project the work that the nonprofit is doing through Staple House and beyond it. Very cool. So I've never eaten at Staple House. It has been on my list for, for years. So I can't wait to be there. But now, since we're in this whole COVID-19 quarantine thing, the restaurant has retooled and mm-hmm. doing something so cool. If you can share a little bit more about that, and then and then I really want to dive deep into Giving Kitchen. Oh, I love it. Yeah. So Staple House is doing something really spectacular. You know, I made a bit of a transition late last year after being with my partners in the, in the restaurant for four and a half years. And I ended up kind of uh, releasing my portion of partnership to them to allow them the opportunity to really take it. Um, and I, I ended up coming over to the staff of Giving Kitchen full time last November. So when all of this happened, um, which obviously was just recently a month ago, um, Ryan and Kara decided, again, my former business partners decided that <clears throat> instead of Staple House turning into, you know, still a full service restaurant and doing takeout and whatnot, they decided that they wanted to kind of reinvigorate that momentum of pay it forward mentality. Uh, So they ended up turning Staple House into Staple House Soup Kitchen, uh, where they are free of charge giving away meals to hospitality food service uh, industry members who've been affected by COVID-19. And they're giving away anywhere from 50 to 100 meals seven days a week to anybody who comes and needs it. It's pretty awesome. Yeah. And they're beautiful staple house meals, aren't they? Yeah. It's yeah. Not They're pretty amazing. Sandwiches. Ryan is a, an incredibly talented chef who really is mindful of, um, you know, health and wellness. Um, so he, it's not that he doesn't use butter and delicious fat, but there is an incredible amount of, um, intention and attention to, you know, the food that he puts together. So, you know, as long as, uh, you know, he's doing it and we're, he's nourishing kind of mind, body, and soul through food. Uh, that's, that is absolutely their purpose. Yeah. So love that. And I think when, when quarantine hit and we, we started seeing, uh, the the impact, I think the restaurant workers and the restaurants, I mean, just so heartbreaking to see what is happening in that community. So, uh, just what a blessing that you guys are there Mm -hmm. to provide that level of support. And you've been there for a number of years. So let's talk a little bit more about giving kitchen Mm -hmm. and kind of the overall mission of the, the nonprofit and how exactly you deliver that mission to restaurant workers in need. Yeah. So Giving Kitchen is a nonprofit uh, started here in in Metro Atlanta, serving the entire state of Georgia. 
uh, offering financial assistance and a network of community resources to all food service workers who are impacted uh, by a crisis, including an injury, um, um, an illness, the death of a family member, an immediate family member, or a housing disaster like a flood or fire. Giving Kitchen can be there to support them through financial assistance. And like I said, um, community resources um, financial assistance, we cover rent or mortgage, basic living expenses and utilities. Uh, when someone is out of work for some time, making sure that they've got a roof over the head and can get back onto their feet. Um, and then those community resources are a really valuable tool and, and help for us and, and for our community because they are a connection to service providers uh, at either low cost or sliding scale services. Um, and we are able to kind of connect those, those food service workers to mental health providers or other so uh, physicians or, or dental care or housing and food stability um, resources like that even for anyone in the food service industry who, who qualifies for a financial assistance program or not. It's actually become one of our um, uh, larger, more kind of fast growing programs uh, just due to the amount of people who come to us and look to us as, again, that beacon of, of hope um, and resource that we're able to provide them in the right direction. Yeah. So I, I'm imagining you've been crushed with applications for aid. We, yes, we have. <laughs> My goodness. That's, um, almost an insane understatement. It is, it was, I mean, and we've, we've gotten to the point where, and thank, thank goodness, you know, for systems and really great leadership, which is a really important thing to oh, note, I think yeah. during this mm-hmm. time for anyone. Um, we, in the first five days since COVID-19 impacted Georgia specifically, first five days, we saw more inquiries for assistance than we did in those first five days than we did throughout the entire year of 2018 the entire year. And for a 12 person staff, Mm. you can imagine obviously the overtime put in and the, in the systems that we had in place that we, that a little bit of tweaking here and there, but to be able to kind of take those people in and, and give them an opportunity to, to find some help and stability through our resources was really amazing. We were seeing, so that's 20 times the normal amount of inquiries coming to us. Um, and four times the amount of eligible um, individuals that were actually able to help. That's what we're seeing on a, on a weekly basis at this point is four times the amount of eligible uh, food service workers coming to us who, who are needing financial help. Oh, so you obviously are seeking donations mm-hmm. um, specifically to help get, get you through this time of quarantine and, and COVID until people can kind of get back on on their feet. I guess that's your number one call. Right you know, now. I would say we had two calls. Um, donations are incredibly important. You know, the, the, the thing that I like to remind everybody is, you know, we likely you, me, we all have our favorite bartenders and our servers and our chefs and, and those dishwashers and anybody within that food service, you know, sure. world yeah. that we love. Mm-hmm. We go out to eat all the time. Going out to eat is about community. It's about gathering. We're yes. there for celebration. Yes. We're there for, for just that, that mm-hmm. engagement. And you know, these are, these are people who are suffering greatly right now and even more so than they may have in the past. But what happens at, you know, today when this server bartender chef is affected by a crisis, whether that is COVID-19 related or not, um, we see so many, um, uh, you know, illness, injuries, funerals happen on a daily basis. And these individuals are in more crisis today because of COVID-19, but what happens to them when something else happens down the road and that chef who was sick is in a car accident in six months and breaks a leg and is out of work for 12 weeks, or, you know, that server who, um, you know, broke her, her wrist and is out of work for six weeks, but she has a child. And what happens when that child is sick next year, or if that child becomes sick next year, I mean, we're looking at clients coming to giving kitchen who, who quite literally have, have children in the NICU who, who don't make it. Um, you know, there are often times that we, we pay for funeral expenses because a parent is having to bury a child. It's, these are real life, you know, circumstances. Um, and so the reality is, is that the giving kitchen, because we support such a big community of people, um, when you look at the entire state of Georgia, we're looking at just shy of 500,000 food service workers spanning the state and, and, you know, the resources that giving kitchen is able to provide Mm -hmm. through that financial assistance and that, that resource program. Um, it means that 
you know, were, were vital, were vital for these food service workers to be here today and in the future. So raising money right now, of course, and fundraising is, is of vital importance to our stability Mm -hmm. to make sure that we are here to support them today, tomorrow, and in the future. Um, But, you know, the other thing that we talk about all the time is Giving Kitchen has just started in the last couple of years of, you know, of that expansion process. So when Giving Kitchen first formed, we were a nonprofit just catering to our a full service restaurant, you know, group. So if you worked in a full service restaurant and you came to us, we could help you. Now, in the last few years, we've been able to expand our offerings to cover all food service workers. So whether or not you are in a full service restaurant, you work in catering, you Mm -hmm. work in a concession, um, or even have a food truck, we are available to be a resource for you. And then, of course, as we expanded to cover the entire state a couple of years ago. So we always say, you know, sharing our story is is of equal importance because it is, you know, education is always going to be of, of a high priority for us as well as raising money um, because they go hand in hand. So sharing our story and our mission um, is just as important as the dollars that we can raise today. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we will get through this. We'll, we will get through this COVID thing and life will return to normal and people will be back in restaurants. And I think that's one of the things I miss the most is just being able, you know, to go to a restaurant and have a nice meal and food is love. Yeah, It is my love language for sure. Yeah. And I just, I really, I really miss that. And community, I love the fact that um, you guys are, you know, there it's, it's a community that exists for mm-hmm. sure uh, within the restaurant community and to see You've had some high profile donors in Atlanta step up to support the Give a Kitchen and recognizing the, the importance of that industry to quality of life. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. You know, we've been really lucky to have, you know, again, I think some really great clarity and purpose uh, within our organization. And that's proven by leadership um, and making sure that we um, are offering the resources that we know that we can offer. We, we understand very clearly what the Giving Kitchen can do and what we cannot do. And we had to really recalibrate and and make sure that we understood that and reminded ourselves of that, you know, right when COVID-19 impacted Georgia specifically, because there were an inundation of people coming to us saying, I need help. I'm, I'm now unemployed or underemployed. And the, the thing that we had to remember, because again, we're, we're in an organization and, you know, in nonprofit, you're there for service. I mean, so your heart is gigantic um, and you want to offer help to everybody the reality is is that we couldn't and we realize that you know with clarity and purpose and understanding the fact that if there's 500,000 food service workers in our state of Georgia and we as an organization if we were to you know pay one month of rent for all five hundred thousand dollars we physically do not have the funding or the capacity to do that. And we would fail miserably realizing that having our clarity and our purpose with what we do standing, you know, standing firm on our mission and just making sure that we tell a really clear and concise story. Um, and it's, it's one backed by compassion and care, which is what we always talk about. Then there's no reason that we, um, you know, can't fulfill our duty in the best way possible and help even more people. And I, and again, with the, the numbers that we're seeing on a consistent basis, um, uh, we're, we're still um, in the fight for all food service workers, but I think we're doing a pretty good job organizationally. That's amazing. And so we both know the way this works is somebody gets a hand up and then mm-hmm. they in turn are able to pay it back. So I think it's going to be fun to watch the unleashing of generosity that unfolds after this because of organizations like you. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that is really your story because in your time of need, you had people reach in and lift you up Mm -hmm. and um, look at what you're doing now, Jen. It's just really so amazing. Oh, you're sweet to say that. I, I, I will say, you know, absolutely, you know, we talk about community a lot. It is absolutely a team effort. Um, you know, nothing can be done with just, you know, the weight of, of everything on one person. And um, the pay it forward mentality is so true. You know, one of my favorite things to see is um, the clients that come to Giving Kitchen for help. Um, a lot of times in turn volunteer for other events mm. throughout the year. So it's pretty special to see that exact same pay it forward mentality. They come to us, we provide some help and in turn, they, they pay it forward. Yeah, that's awesome. So I understand you guys won a little award too recently. 
We did yeah, that. Tell that little us about award that. Is probably, yeah, one of my most. Uh, gosh, yeah, that's amazing. So we were really blessed and honored with uh, receiving the Humanitarian of the Year Award by the James Beard Foundation uh, for Giving Kitchen. That's yeah, uh, really spectacular. I um, I think for an organization of our size, um, it was I think the first time the James Beard Award had recognized um, that type of a kind of a service and and nonprofit uh, for Humanitarian of the Year. But it was really spectacular. So that definitely set a stage and a precedent for us from a national perspective, for sure. Okay. Well, I love this part of your story. You found love again, remarried. Yes. And there is a new addition to the family. If you could please share more about that, Jen. Yes, I would love to. So, you know, when Ryan passed away, he and I had... um, an immense amount of time to talk about what my future might be like. And I felt really blessed and lucky to have uh, my late husband kind of wish for that for me, you know, really want me to kind of be as powerful as I wanted to be after he passed, Um, find love, have a family um, and really kind of, you know, move forward was, was the thing, not move on, but really move forward in, in positive light. And I, and I say all the time to people, you know, I, I feel that Ryan gave me a really great responsibility, uh, to fulfill that. Um, and I feel, um, like I've been able to do that for myself as well, that it took me a while to learn that, that this was a lot for me. Um, but I, I did get remarried. I actually got remarried in, in October of 2017 to my husband, John Wayne, John. and we just welcomed our newborn son named blue on February. <gasps> February 1st of this year. So um, he's 10 weeks old now and actually he's 11 weeks old today. Um, But cooing and laughing and totally bringing us immense joy and snuggles all the time. It's pretty awesome. Well, that is just so amazing. And congratulations. And um, there's hope, you know, sometimes you, you can't see it when you're in the middle of unbelievable grief, but your story is just such a beautiful example of just keep going, um, keep doing, you know, one day at a time, doing mm-hmm. the next best thing. And um, what, what an example you have set. So one last question for yeah. you. So the word relevate means to uplift or inspire. In closing, what words of inspiration do you have for people who may be going through a tough time now and may just need to hear a little, a little word of encouragement. I have uh, my favorite quote is by uh, one of the, the strongest fighters I've ever known, my late husband, Ryan Heidinger, and they are anything long lasting or worthwhile takes time and complete surrender. Yes, it does. Amen to that, sister. Thank you so much for your time. Perfect. And can't believe we didn't hear the baby cooing or crying in the background. He's probably he takes gonna... really good naps. <laughs> <laughs> Another blessing indeed. Well, and if people would like to donate or support or learn more about the Giving Kitchen, how they how can they get in touch with you? Please come and see us over at our website. We actually have a website and an app. So you can find the Giving Kitchen app on iOS or Android and come and visit us at thegivingkitchen.org. Okay. I'm going to come see you when this is all over so I can hug your neck. Thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. Have a great day. Take care. Bye, Jen. So what does it mean to be medicine? I love that question asked by Ryan Turner, an Atlanta restaurateur and one of the founders of The Giving Kitchen. What does it mean to be medicine? Our hope doesn't come in a little bottle. It never has. Medicine resides in our heart and our hands. It's power unleashed. We go through trials. Jen is a powerful and beautiful example of this. Along with those who came alongside Jen and Ryan to help bring their dream of Staple House and the Giving Kitchen to life. How can you be medicine? A beacon of hope to those in your family and your community. To learn more about The Giving Kitchen, visit thegivingkitchen.org. To learn more about me, your host of the Relevate Podcast, visit my website, rena-olson.com. Please share this episode, leave a review, and subscribe. It really means a lot to be able to continue growing and sharing these messages of hope and inspiration. This episode, there's also an unedited video of my conversation with Jen that you can check out. You can find that on the blog page of my website, rena-olson.com blog, or on my Rena Olson YouTube channel. Stay safe and well, friends. 
and keep the hope alive. Let's be medicine. I'm Rena Olson, and this is Relevate.